Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Calvary Lutheran, fourth Sunday after Pentecost. So great to see you all here, gathered together in this sanctuary with us all. Um, and with uh, our, our youth from Puerto Rico, we have returned. Our youth from Kairos Camp have returned. And it is good to see so many of you here in the pews today. Uh, they, um, uh, there is a couple of announcements I want to share with you before I'm going to hand this time over to Pastor Lauren. Uh, lovely. <laughs> Uh, Sandy, that's not your fault. It might be have to do with the blue microphone um, or this one. But w last week we had issues with that, and if that continues, we might just start a this is the pulpit mic. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, anyway, we're working on it. Thank you uh, to Mark Daryl in particular, who is coming here to help uh, figure out this microphone situation. Uh, and we are are we can be heard, but we also have a static now too. But I wanted to lift up that new outreach we are doing for unsheltered pets in Morganton. On July 18th, after I return from the Holy Land, after Camp Christbound, we are going to have a new ministry start in the back of our church. And uh, this is kind of a culmination of a number of uh, different uh, ministries and even grants that we have put forward in the, and what we're going to do to outreach to um, our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Uh, there is, uh, we received and I want, I'm lifting this up as a celebration. We lit, received $20,000 from the Casey Peeler Fund from the Synod to uh, uh, renovate the back part of our church to create uh, these kinds of ministries and outreach that we will be starting off very small at first with uh, uh, this ministry of uh, raisins clinic for unsheltered pets. Uh, we are hoping to grow that into uh, heartworm medication, into pest control, so uh, flea and tick. Uh, control into uh, giving, um, a, make, creating a database that will be held for uh, the the owners of these pets who love them very much but uh, have difficulty tr keeping um, the the dates of when these shots and medications were applied. Uh, there's a, a number of ways that we can really uh, reach out to our, our neighbors and and help them a lot, and especially in um, with the pets that are on the streets. Um, maybe some of you met, uh, some of, have met some of these pets and know that a year ago or so, one of them who we were very fond of died from uh, a difficult uh, life on the street and not getting the proper medication. And this is uh, our effort to try to care for that, uh, care for all of creation. And so uh, there is, um, there we have grant money, we have, uh, now we need volunteers, people to help with all of this. And so uh, we have a Don, Dr. Don Hemstreet, who is a, a veterinarian um, at, at an animal clinic nearby, and he is going to be administering the vaccinations. And we are working also with Judy Brown from the Matthew 25 Center at BUCM, who is going to be communicating with all of our neighbors who uh, have unsheltered pets. And then uh, we are going to be needing you all, members of, con of this congregation, to help keep this data to be there to help uh, people stand in line and, and to converse with them, to uh, provide food for them even, uh, and uh, healthy food for their uh, pets as well. Uh, uh, Bill Nybeck actually already got in touch with me and is putting together a thriving action plan, which is a $250 grant. <laughs>
one's on. It's on? Okay. Um, I'll keep mine really brief. We're home from Puerto Rico. It was an amazing experience. We have lots of stories. You're right in there? All right. We have, <laughs> we have lots of stories to share, so we are going to host a lunch on September 10th. We want to wait till kind of summer is over and people are back. Um, but September 10th, after worship that day, mark your calendars. We will make some Puerto Rican food for you. We will have a slideshow. We'll have stories to share. And um, this is a thank you uh, to the congregation for all the support financially, prayerfully, all the things that you've done to help us uh, have this experience. So I want you to know that. The other thing is, speaking of communications, my phone may or may not work for the next few days. It's uh, a little bit broken. So I have a new one on the way. But if you need me, email is my friend. So uh, if you need me before about Wednesday, um, just email me. All right, thanks. The congregation, please rise and face the baptismal fonts for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to invite any children forward for a children's message. down <laughs> or up down all right welcome good to have y'all here okay so um you may have heard that we just came back from puerto rico and i brought an instrument with me because i don't have all the hands here all right and this is a rhythm instrument that you can see often in puerto rico and you see how it's kind of a hollowed out gourd and then you take one of these and it just makes some rhythm noises, right? What is rhythm? What's, a, what's rhythm? What is it? Something with music? Okay, that's, that's one thing it has to do with music sometimes. Yeah, what's rhythm? What can you guys think about with rhythm? Drums? Yes, yeah, so when we're thinking about music, it kind of keeps a beat for us, right? So it's... It, that's tempo, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, so um, so it kind of keep a rhythm is, is kind of like a repeated pattern, right? So we can have rhythm in instruments, like this could have a repeated pattern that kind of keeps a beat. Maybe drums do that. Um, we have different rhythms like that. This um, I actually saw used in a church service. There were a couple kids learning how to keep rhythm with the music in church. And then we went to a street festival later that night, and people were pulling them out there and using them. So they were using it in church. They were using it out in the community. It was a rhythm that kind of went with them in all the parts of their lives. Um, and other rhythms, other patterns might be 
how we um, live out each week of our lives, right? That coming to church might be part of your rhythm. Um, prayer might be part of a rhythm. And those are rhythms and things, things that we do repeatedly that help us kind of keep the beat of our lives, right? They kind of, they kind of help us um, have a pattern in how we do things, and they bring some meaning too, right? So if, um, if praying is something that is part of your rhythm, we do that in church, but just like this instrument that I saw these kids playing in church, we do it outside of church too, right? The rhythms of our faith and our worship together move into the other parts of our lives as well. And that's kind of what, I, what really struck me with this instrument was how those rhythms moved with us. Um, another rhythm is a heartbeat, right? Right? Can you think about what a heartbeat sounds like? Boom, 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 right? When you think about, and everybody carries a heartbeat with them wherever. Yeah, heartbeat goes with you. What? But we carry a heartbeat with us wherever we go, right? And so I want you to think about rhythms in your life. So whether it's prayer or whether it's music, things that we might do here and that go out into your life. And then I want you to think about the rhythm of your heartbeat and think about that when your heartbeat, that's God saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And that happens here and it happens out there too, right? Those rhythms go with us everywhere we go. So let's pray and give thanks. Gracious God, we thank you for rhythms in our lives, whether it's rhythms of music that move us to dance and sing, or rhythms of our patterns of life like prayer and worship, or the rhythm of our heartbeat where we're reminded that you love us and you go with us. Help us to um, remember those patterns and rhythms and to, uh, every time we do them, to remember that you love us and that we love you too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot, for I hear many whispering. Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps. He can be enticed, and we can prevail against him, and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let's see, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
second reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 1b through 11. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is, enough for the ma the dis it is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet what, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I think if you asked around the room right now, you would find that most people here would define the Gospel of the Lord as being a proclamation that offers the good news of Jesus Christ regarding life, grace, salvation, forgiveness, peace, and healing. And I would agree. But when you hear Jesus say things like, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but the sword. And then go on to talk of families turning on one another. It might make you wonder, right? Especially if this is the first time you've ever heard this scripture. You might wonder, what's going on here? And why in the world did we all just claim this as the gospel of the Lord? 
How could this be good news? Over the last several days as I have been preparing for this sermon, I have felt a particular friction as the grace, peace, love, and forgiveness that I seek to proclaim in every sermon rubs up against our gospel reading for today. And as I sit with these words, I find a long, I long for one of the many other readings where I can be reassured of God's intention of bringing love and peace like on that most holy night we, all, we call Christmas when God came to live among us in the flesh. I don't like this friction. It makes me extremely uncomfortable. And that's just me being honest. How about you? How does this gospel reading sit with you? How does it fit into your understanding and experience of who Jesus is? I imagine it's very uncomfortable. And that's why I can't go on to some other nicer reading. When we get readings like this in our lectionary, we must deal with the entirety of the gospel. We must deal with the entirety of God's message for God's people. Otherwise, we are just picking and choosing and making God out to be whatever we want God to be. So this has taken me quite a bit of time but as I have read this over and over, I have found a very different emphasis that helped to open up to me what I think is really happening here. One that I certainly did not get the first few times I read it through. I'm now contemplating the understanding that this is less about what the gospel is as the good news of Jesus Christ and more about what happens when the gospel becomes incarnate, intersects into within the world. Think about it. If the gospel is good news, good news for the poor, the outsider, the refugee, the sick, the hungry, and the imprisoned, good news for all those who are listed in Matthew 25, what is it for those who do exceedingly well in this world, who actually are experiencing success from those who are oppressed or who are poor? Those who have it all, who have strength and power. Sure, Jesus went around sharing the love of God for all people, but he also shook up the religious and political authorities, prodding others to rethink their own realities and understandings of this world around them. The world the authorities had so carefully brought under their control. Jesus is an extremely controversial figure to them, even today. In our Sunday, adult Sunday school class today, we talked about the institutional church and how that has been used as in, and to take advantage of others many times throughout history. When you actually read these Gospels, and I mean read them fully, without skipping over the uncomfortable parts like this one, Jesus comes across as so driven by the truth of who God is and what God intends for the world, not what the political and religious authorities intend, that threats and persecution cannot possibly shake his good news. And so he does just what he says he would. Jesus is not concerned with the pacifying peace of empire. When he says he is not here to bring peace, he is speaking about the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, which was not peace at all, but 200 years of imperial impression. To that, he is willing to bring the sword, the sword of truth, as the Apostle Paul says, which is the word of God. The truth has an edge that will even divide households and familial relationships if that is what it comes to when setting the world free. If we are being honest with ourselves, we'd admit that there is quite a bit less than the gospel that can do even that. Families fragment and divide all the time. It's the voice of someone still seeking power and control that blames that fragmentation on the freeing power of the gospel of Christ. Again, it's not the 200 years of Pax Romana that Jesus is concerned with. It is the eternal reign of Pax Christi, the peace of Christ that he is here to proclaim. But as the professor and theologian Caroline Lewis says, when you preach peace, expect a sword. Because God's peace expects justice. 
God's peace asks for righteousness. God's peace demands value for and regard for all. And God's peace is what will save us all. But still, I am inspired to ask, is this the same Jesus that preaches the Beatitudes? The same one who seeks mercy, not sacrifice. The same one who is so filled with love, grace, and forgiveness, we call him the Good Shepherd. These questions are what have caused me to rewrite this sermon twice already, and I find myself doing it right now again in the pulpit. Because the world is in chaos, especially this past weekend with the Wagner Group invading Moscow or going towards it, and all the war and all the disease and all the suffering that takes place throughout I just found out that a colleague of mine had a terrible, terrible loss in her own family. One that shakes up our faith in many ways. And it makes me think so much about our conversation again in adult Sunday school. And even the the, uh, hymn that we sung at the start of this service about how firm a foundation Jesus is. Because Jesus is indeed the living rock that we cling to as everything else becomes sinking sand. And I know that to be true. But when I deal with this imagery that Jesus is giving to his disciples as he sends them out into the world, turning them from disciples into apostles, I get a little confused and I get frustrated with that confusion because there's already enough chaos in this world, right? I can't stop thinking about the chaos of war and the stories I've heard from members of our own congregation and from members I know who have served in war and from the stories I've heard from my grandfather and how terrible it all is and all the death. And then I think about what Jesus says again to his disciples about death and life. And also what he says about sparrows. He says, are not sparrows, aren't two sparrows bought for a penny? And yet God, not a single one of them will drop to the ground without God being aware. Because God cares. God cares so much. God knows every number of hair on our heads. God cares about every sparrow and every life. Everyone who falls in war, everyone who falls from disease in a pandemic, every life that is brought into existence by the source of all life. God cares so much that God gave God's only son. Again, we are all surrounded by death. We all have beginnings and endings. But as the Apostle Paul says, as we proclaim at the start of every funeral service and our baptisms, we are all dead to sin through Christ and made alive in Christ. I keep thinking about that, especially as I have to preach on these difficult sermons. I think about that expression, what hill do you want to die on? (laughs) I found a few here and there, but as I read the second reading for today, and I heard, and I had two funerals, actually three in the past two weeks, and I proclaimed that message from the Romans reading today. I realize there is only one hill in Christ, and that is Calvary, where the cross is firmly planted in our world, where God's life and death is, takes on the full experience and sin of the world and wraps it all in, the beginnings and endings, into the eternal love of God. Again, in baptism, we are marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit forever. There is only one hill, 
And that is God, God's hill, chosen on Mount Calvary, chosen for all of creation to pour out God's spirit on all of creation so that we might have eternal love and the peace that surpasses all understanding. At Kairos camp, that is confirmation camp, up at an, in Asheville, on a hilltop, on a mountain. And Kairos is called Kairos because it is God's time set apart. We spent this past week with over 120 youth talking about prayer and about how prayer is a relationship and how prayer makes a huge impact in this world. And it took quite a bit of time, but as we got to know each other and be in relationship with each other and trust one another to share our deep prayers with each other, but we got there. And the prayers that we shared as an entire group, as we wrote intercessory prayers through a great exercise that I don't actually have the time to get into, but I want to share briefly about. We shared very, very big prayers. And we, I mean the youth of our congregations in North Carolina and South Carolina, even Alabama and Georgia, all who gather together to worship God and find more, find out more about God's love for us all. We lifted up prayers that came straight from the hearts of youth, of children, of middle schoolers. They lifted up abuse of all kinds, child abuse, domestic abuse, drug and animal abuse. They lifted up bullying, gun violence, adoption, illness and disease, homelessness, war, oppressed people, especially in the LGBTQIA plus community. All of these came straight from the hearts of our youth and our congregations. The same that we oftentimes as adults try to shelter youth from. But we are surrounded by it every day. This chaos, the same chaos that youth most certainly are aware of. And it is there in prayer where God gets us to care like God cares about sparrows, about every hair on our heads, about all the world, about all of that chaos. God cares. And in prayer, we are taught to care and trust in the reign of God so much. So much we are willing to face down our fears, knowing that there is nothing that can stop us, nothing that can keep us from being who God calls us to be. Prayer is where we become aware of both our privilege and the chaos that surrounds us. Then through relationship with God and one another, prayer is where we receive the Spirit who drives us forward to fearlessly commit ourselves to the gospel of our Lord. In prayer, the awareness and the relationship we have with God and one another drives us forward with the Spirit to send us out as apostles to make a difference in this world to share God's word God's life freeing truth life saving truth to reform the institutions in this world and to show the world God cares about every single sparrow every single person in prayer, we find ourselves being made whole and we are able to struggle with all the chaos, all the confusion, and God lifts up, moves us forward with the gospel of our Lord. I ask you to pray with me now. I've been told many times when you don't know how to end a sermon, end with the word amen, and that's what we do in prayer, right? Amen means so be it. Let it be done. So let us pray. God, our hearts break. 
by all the chaos. We seek your word, the sword of truth. Sever the bonds of oppression, of chaos, of fear. Set us free with that truth to love one another so boldly that any fears and doubts are left so far behind. We have a blessed forgetfulness. And all we can see is what is ahead. The promise of your kingdom, where we see each other face to face, and our joy is made complete in you. Fill us with your spirit. Open our hearts and minds and eyes to that love that you drive us forward in. That you wrap up our beginnings, our ending, and our endings in. And your mercy and your love and your care. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. You entice your church to speak truth 
that challenges false notions of peace, prevail upon us with the good news of Christ's death and resurrection, that we are compelled to share the gospel with all the world. God in your mercy. Update your watch. Not even a sparrow goes un unnoticed. Safeguard plant and animal habitats threatened by melting glaciers, rising oceans, and receding coastlines amplify the voices of those calling for responsible stewardship of the Earth's resources. God, in your mercy. Hear our, our world is enduring violence and dis destruction. Rescue your people and nations experiencing conflict or crisis. Thwart the efforts of those who sow chaos and terror and guide those working to bring about peace and reconciliation. God, in your mercy. Hear our you have counted even the hairs of our heads. Reassure anyone experiencing poverty, homelessness, unemployment, or exploitation that every life has value. Look favor favorably upon all who struggle. Give peace to those who have sustained a loss and bring healing and comfort to the sick and homebound, especially Patty Britton, Martha Mills, Liz, Liz Wilson, and the family and friends of Mitchell Darhush and all those we pray for now, out loud and silently in our hearts. Answer us, for your steadfast love is good. God, in your mercy. Even when we experience rejection, your love invites us to a new life. Lift up anyone who feels shunned or excluded on account of their gender, race, sexual orientation, Gender, gender identity, national origin, or any other human distinction. Make your people one. God, in your mercy. All who have died with Christ also live with him. We give thanks for all the saints whose faithful confession inspired our own discipleship and raise us with them to eternal life. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all.
are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to Christ. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending Our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. are called to Christ's table. Come, eat what is good. Thanks. Thank you, God.
rise as you are able and receive the blessings of our Lord. In the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the re refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world. Through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.